So I, I'm going to talk to you today about some of the work that I've been doing with my collaborators, uh, Larissa Reams and Ted Mansell. A lot of this talk is due to the hard work of, of Dr. Reams. Um, she's done a great job helping me try to wrangle some of this. Um, so why am I talking about this? Well, last year uh, in the summer, we started running um, the FE3 LAM um, using the initial conditions from the uh, our wharf based uh, warrant forecast ensemble analyses. Um, so we wanted to sort of, as a first sort of sanity check, what happens when we use run the FE3 using warrant forecast analyses. We looked at a few cases, and after we uh, sort of come up with some <clears throat> model configuration issues that had to be worked out, uh, we noticed that the FE3 solutions had two major differences from what we were used to seeing in the um, ARW-based runs. Um, one is the, uh, the updraft speeds were much larger, uh, much much more intense at the height of the maximum W, which sort of makes sense physically, is also higher. And what was sort of a little bit more disturbing, or at least equally disturbing, is the fact that we saw very major differences in the surface pressure fields. They're sort of maximized down around uh, two, three, in the lowest two or three kilometers. And in particular, we really didn't see much high pressure underneath the um, underneath the coal pools, which is sort of an, a, a normal feature you would see even at three kilometers. And here's just some stuff that some of you may have seen before. Um, these are profiles taking from uh, nine by nine or, or, or something like that, or, or seven by seven grids. Uh, it's located around the maximum W. We look at all the storms from six forecast hours. So we run six hours, six hours of three hour forecasts six times where we have three hour forecasts and we look at these profiles. And what you can see is that when you look at, I really hate not having a pointer. Um, if you look at the perturbation pressure fields, um, the non-green lines are all the FE3s. Those are various configurations for splitting. They all seem to have these tremendous sort of on average underneath the updraft surface pressure minimums, whereas the wharf is about half that value. And they all seem to have vertical velocities um, that are between 20, 20 and 30% larger uh, and higher up at 10 kilometers. A little bit interesting to us was the fact that uh, we don't see a big difference in the uh, vertical velocity or, excuse me, vertical vorticity profiles, but I think that's probably more of a location issue and averaging issue. So we, we were a little bit sort of perplexed by this, and you can see this if we were looking at the actual fields. And so we wanted to go back and so ask ourselves, how are we going to figure this out? And one thing we weren't going to figure it out is in a full terrain, full physics uh, model. Uh, you don't have any sort of uh, reference state to actually compare the results to. So we went back and uh, through a lot of hard work by Larissa, we're able to get the FE3 to uh, run idealized soundings from well-known case studies from literature, basically the Wiseman Klemp case studies, and we've also done some sort of idealized uh, real uh, single sounding runs from famous cases. And so we've set up the uh, FE3. It's running the CAM physics. So it, it basically has all the physics on uh, because it's hard to turn off um, the PBL and other things and, and the land surface. But we ran the wharf the exact same way. So basically, we tried to pair up the physics in the uh, FE3 in that. Domains are fairly large, so we don't have to worry about boundary conditions. They're fairly deep. Um, and we basically initialize things in the wharf model and then use a sort of modified version of change res created by Dr. Reams to move that over to FE3. And we're, we we're going to work on comparing a, a variety of different types, but I'm going to talk about supercells and moist, uh, moist thermal today. So this is a three kilometer quarter circle supercell. Uh, if you don't know what that is, you can look it up. It's just basically a sort of very basic test run you get and you should produce a right dominated uh, splitting supercell with all some nice properties. These are the first two columns are at Z equals one kilometer. Uh, the second two columns in the supercell plots are at the surface. And if you look at the overall solutions, they're not, and, and sort of grossly, they're not that different. But when you start looking at the details, there's some interesting differences. Um, the one thing that we noticed here is that the FE3 surface pressure gradient is about 17 millibars from the high pressure to the low underneath, in this particular case, the left motor. I don't think that's particularly significant. 
but it's just an extreme pressure gradient, particularly at three kilometers. Um, that's almost like a tornado scale pressure gradient. Uh, it, oh, it's just obviously spread out. Uh, whereas the F ARW version of this storm has about a four and a half to five millibar pressure gradient. And that's pretty reasonable for the, the given environments. Um, the second thing is, is that the extent of the cold pools is very different. Um, the FE3 cold pool, while having about the same amount of negative buoyancy, uh, in, at least in maximum values, um, is probably about two thirds as large. And when you actually put that together with um, the low level updrafts that you see here at one kilometer, you see that the splitting process is very different in the FP3, at least the three kilometer resolution. Um, and these sort of hold up at one kilometer, I'll show you in a minute. So we definitely have a different uh, thing going on there. Uh, here's a one kilometer version in resolution of that. And um, basically what you see is the same type of uh, features. There's a very different sort of splitting pattern. The surface pressure gradient has relaxed a little bit, but it's still like 14 millibars. Uh, whereas the RERW is around six. Um, these buoyancy fields look a little bit more similar now, but again, if you sort of imagine out of the domain, the top, that's still a larger extent. There's, there's definitely more lateral propagation. Uh, again, there's a lot of interesting differences here. The, 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 the reflectivity the differences are perhaps not huge, but certainly you see a much more distinct uh, storm in the ARW I don't, on the left side. I, and, and I don't think that's very important, to be honest with you. So then we asked ourselves, well, can we make things even simpler and see the same differences? And so we tried a moist thermal in a uh, calm wind environment. Um, and we made sure the initial conditions are very uh, close to being identical after one time step. And I just want to show you uh, one, set, one result. Uh, this is at 20 minutes. So these are now vertical cross sections through the thermal at three kilometer resolution. And if you look at the vertical velocity profiles on the second column, um, there's definitely differences. The magnitudes are uh, around 40 meters per second. There's definitely, it's, a, it's in a different phase, if you will, different size. And I think the, one of the reasons why you can see that is um, we, we have a very different pressure field down here. Um, again, the maximum pressure, low pressure is at the surface again, whereas in the ARW, it's uh, becoming elevated and moving aloft. And um, if we look, uh, now at a cross section uh, across the maximum updrafts. Um, this is now at W max. So on the top, it's about at seven and a half kilometers and at the bottom, it's about a 10. So there's not gonna be a lot of differences. You see a tremendous difference in scale in the thermal dynamics. Um, there's uh, very different scales. The FP3 is, is, is sort of like this giant, huge plume. Um, and it's not really clear what's going on. The W profiles at the maximum overdraft don't really look that much different. Obviously, the, vertic the pressure gradients are, are somewhat different since the dist vertical distribution is different. Um, and, and one of the things that occurs to me is, well, is this what's driving this uh, difference in the pressure field? This is the previous pressure field plot, is that maybe this is mostly uh, the pressure fields are responding most, more to the hydrostatic effect, to the larger scale of the plume uh, thermal than uh, than the ARW. So these are things that we need to actually figure out. Two so minutes left. Summarize, um, comparison to the FP3 solutions um, to our current state of the art show some large differences. Surface pressure field gradients are anomalously large, very low pressure under updrafts, which at three kilometers is kind of excessive. Um, this is going to change the low level flow. It may re reduce the splitting by impeding the gust fronts and perhaps lower storm motion. Um, these differences are greater than what's seen in the ARW previous, or when comparing ARW to solutions to like ARPS or CM1 or to some of the other models. And these differences could impact uh, a lot of things that are important to weather prediction. Uh, and the differences seem to be consistent. So I think we can use these simplified environments to, to trace this down. For our future work, uh, the use of the FE3 core for CAM scales uh, needs obviously some more work. I think it's important to understand what's going on here. Um, the historical focus for the model was on global applications for uh, understandable reasons, and we need to really understand what's going on here. Uh, and we need to resolve these differences if they're right or they're wrong. If they are not quite right, uh, or for some reason the model approximations are working in these regimes, we may need to consider changing the core numerics for the non-hydrostatic while maintaining the overall accuracy. 
And I just want to make a point that this work is significantly held back by the fact that we don't have a single source comprehensive technical documentation of the non-hydrostatic core used by NOAA's community model. And I think this is a big problem and has been for many years. And I'm going to write a technical report with my collaborators and perhaps some groups, other groups uh, within NOAA uh, on these issues for uh, by the end of the year. Thank you. That's my talk. Thank you, Lou. Appreciate it. Do we have any questions for Lou? Uh, sure. This is Stan. Uh, Lou, can you say more about the implications for one kilometer for one on forecast? You've shown differences here, both three kilometer and one kilometer. Does this have more of an issue for uh, uh, convective mode evolution that one kilometer, even than three kilometers, or it's just an issue for both scales? I don't know. I mean, you, you can't argue with the fact that the three kilometer sort of uh, uh, um, ha um, uh, HREF runs are not bad. So, I mean, there is some inconsistency there, but I think what's going to happen, again, as you well know, Stan, once we get down to doing rapid data simulation on the, on the scales of tens of minutes, um, if your model is not evolving correctly, then you're going to have biases in the evolution, which are going to then uh, impact your data simulation very negatively. So, I mean, I think there's issues with propagation in the ARW. Uh, Corey's, I see Corey on here, Corey Potvin. There are differences in propagation effects that, uh, the ARW may not be the gold standard, but I, I really don't understand this this uh, pressure field thing at the ground. Um, so yeah, I, we definitely are going to be going down to kilometer-like resolutions. Uh, even in the ARW, we're going to do that. And any significant model uh, tendencies that are sort of outside the norm that we're used to seeing are going to cause problems. Great. Thank you. Um, I will just remind people that we do have the Slack channel open and available so uh, we can have some continued discussion there. Yep, I'll be and, yeah, perfect. Thanks, Lou. And um, at this point, Lou, you can stop sharing your screen and we'll toss it over to Adam Clark, who's going to talk to us about the NOAA hazardous weather testbed spring forecasting experiment. Looks like we've got your screen, but we can't hear you, Adam. Whoops. I guess it would help if I unmuted myself. Okay. So, uh, yeah, just like Lou, I, for some reason, totally forgot how to use Google Meet, but here we are. Um, so we had definitely a different look to the spring forecasting experiment this year um, where we went virtual. So the HWT is closed for business, but we kind of uh, are able to work in this uh, virtual space. So um, I kind of wanted to talk about just how this uh, experiment evolved. We were under this very, very severe time crunch because it wasn't until mid-March that we really realized that it wouldn't be possible to do an in-person uh, experiment. I think everyone kind of had it in the back of their head that that was a possibility, but um, it seemed to happen really fast. Um, so we really had two options. Um, we could cancel the experiment or we could do it virtually. And pretty much everyone on the organizing team um, wanted to carry on with the experiment and uh, figure out a way to do it virtually. So we had you know, a lot of like momentum and key research areas going. And if we didn't do the experiment, you know, everyone felt like that it would have been um, just really bad to not be able to carry on with that momentum. So in areas like SAR FV3, which I need to um, start calling LAM, uh, I got to get used to that. Um, Cam ensemble configuration work, we on forecast and several other areas of research. So uh, by late March, we had gotten the go ahead for management to, to go ahead with the experiment uh, in a virtual capacity. And then two weeks later, uh, we had put together a draft of our operations plan. And then it was only like 10 days later that um, we did a couple kind of dry runs uh, with just the organizers. And then uh, Monday, the week after that, um, we started the experiment. So this involved just, um, it happened so fast. Uh, and it, it seems like a long time ago now, but it was just a crazy time. And we had so many people 
um, on our team that really went above and beyond to make the experiment happen. Uh, and it was just a really, you know, unique time in, in the nation's history. So I'm just, you know, super proud to be a, a part of the team that uh, made an experiment like no other happen. Okay, so I suppose I can give a little bit of background. Maybe not everyone is familiar with what we do during these spring experiments. It's five weeks long. It occurs at the peak of the severe weather season. Really, the goal is to accelerate new technologies into operations to improve severe weather prediction. So a lot of it, the work involves documenting the sensitivities and the performance characteristics of convection allowing ensembles. Um, you know, when we're in the test bed um, and we're using, uh, you, you know, we use the same type of workstations that uh, forecasters use, although, uh, you know, we didn't have that in the virtual capacity. Um, we did have a wide range of participants with different backgrounds. Um, so researchers, forecasters, uh, professors, model developers, uh, et cetera. And this really helps with not just, you know, trying to push things into operations, but uh, having researchers work alongside forecasters so that they can, um, you know, figure out how to better gear their own work uh, to help improve forecasting. So this year, uh, this is just a table of the participants. Uh, each week we had our full load of uh, uh, people participating like we, we normally do. Uh, and then we had nine different facilitators um, from SBC, from NSSL, and from uh, SIMS, and also uh, OU. And then I had to kind of compile the different uh, institutions. Uh, so just a mix of uh, university, the weather service, uh, OAR, laboratories, um, national forecasting centers, uh, the environmental modeling center, SIMS, um, international agencies like the UK Met Office, also the Bureau of Meteorology in Australia. So, so just a very wide range of uh, institutions there. And uh, one of the things that we've been doing, uh, and this is the fifth year that we've done it, is uh, this thing called the Community Leverage Unified Ensemble. And this is a way uh, that we can provide more controlled data sets that we can use to kind of better inform uh, CAM ensemble configurations. Um, and so these experimental configurations, um, you know, the last several years, we've compared them to the HREF, which is the operational um, convection allowing ensemble. And so uh, the original motivation for the clue was that we had so many uh, different ensemble data sets being contributed by our collaborators, um, and they were all designed independently, that we had to just coordinate these contributions in a more systematic way to do these controlled experiments. Uh, for this year, we had uh, 41 members, which actually marks, a, a uh, and this is just in the clue, total we had more members than that, um, but that's a bit of a drop from previous years, and really, that's just kind of due to the vagaries of funding cycles. So we didn't have contributions from CAPS and from the OU MAP uh, group, and we had fewer contributions uh, from NCAR. So that's why you see that drop there. Um, as for how the clue was configured, um, I kind of divided it into four um, different experiments or categories of experiments. Um, we had this kind of unique collaboration between NSSL, NCAR, and the UK Met Office where we looked at uh, the sensitivity to uh, the driving model versus uh, the model core. Um, and then we also looked at different time lagging strategies using several sets of model data that included the HER-E and the HER contributed by GSL, um, the UK Met Office model, the UM or the unified model, and also some configurations of the NISL work. And Israel Yurok is gonna talk about um, those experiments um, I think at 240. Then we had several different versions of FV3 that we examined, and then this uh, lightning, uh, no lightning DA experiment with the WERF model. Um, so I just wanted to point out, Israel's talking about the time lagging later, and then Berkeley on Wednesday will be uh, talking about these FV3 experiments. So the clue allows us to uh, do these nice subjective assessments of the different ensemble configurations. This is just an example of the data that we compile after the experiment is over on the performance of these different ensemble subsets. So as in previous years, th these are the results for 2020. Uh, the different, uh, the HREF tends to um, be the best. And so 
Um, href is just hard to beat, uh, you know, multi-model, multi-initial condition, multi-physics, time lag, a lot of different sources of diversity which have been shown uh, to really help with uh, generating uh, reliable uh, forecasts. So um, this is what the schedule looked like, definitely different than previous years. Uh, and this is just for the morning. Um, so I'll draw your attention to kind of the bottom half of this schedule. And the mornings uh, pretty much were focused on doing model evaluations. So for one one hour block, um, we would divide into two groups uh, and each group would have a different set of model eva evaluations that we would go through. And those are listed at the bottom here. And I divided these into kind of different categories. We had ones that were um, looking at different strategies for calibrating model output using uh, machine learning and other calibration methods. Uh, we had different evaluations based on the different clue experiments that I have highlighted here. Uh, and then we did uh, worn on forecast evaluations uh, as well. Two more. Uh, time. Okay, thanks. Uh, and then we had um, an analysis, or, or we had uh, an evaluation of different ways to generate mesoscale analyses. Um, so in the afternoon, uh, this was focused on worn on forecast activities, and uh, we had a much smaller group of people that were present in the afternoon. Um, that was uh, comprised of the facilitators and then uh, NWS forecasters that generated outlooks using worn on forecast. Um, and instead of describing everything that they did, I thought I would just give an example of this worn on forecast output in action. So we had this really nice web interface, um, and this was uh, developed uh, by uh, Brett Roberts um, at SIMS SPC NSSL. Um, and he's also helped us uh, with a lot of the, the web stuff for the HWT. But this was a really cool um, way that we were able to uh, visualize the war on forecast output and then draw experimental severe weather outlooks on top of uh, that data. So this is just me, you know, um, doing a pretend, I think, like tornado outlook for, I think this was at the beginning of May. So, um, so that's it. Um, you know, 10 minutes, uh, <laughs> I got through it. These are the conclusions. We learned a lot, um, even though it was a virtual experiment, but I do want to emphasize that there really is no replacement for the personal interactions that we get when we do things in person. Um, we'll, we'll plan for in-person 2021, but we'll be ready for anything. Uh, and then uh, as for the final report, I hope to have it done by the end of August. Um, and then some of the science things that we've made progress on. Definitely, we've uh, made progress on uh, SAR FV3. Uh, we're on a forecast. We got a lot of very positive feedback this year. Uh, machine learning based methods are really uh, maturing, I think. Um, and, and we were able to show that with uh, some of the assessments that we did this year. And for the uh, CAM ensemble configurations and the clue experiments, I think we, we saw once again the HREF is kind of the king. But, uh, Israel will talk about some of these time lagging experiments that we did that um, we got really positive uh, results from. So that is it. Great, thanks Adam. I know 10 minutes goes by very quickly. So it does. Appreciate <laughs> it. Um, do we have one quick question on the Slack channel for Adam, Jeff? Uh, there's nothing in the Slack channel, so maybe somebody has a question here. Okay, if not, I'll direct you to the Slack channel to talk with Adam there. And we'll move on to our next speaker, who is Brett Roberts. So if you wouldn't mind grabbing the screen, Brett. And he's gonna to talk to us today about um, what does a convection allowing ensemble of opportunity bias in forecasting thunderstorms? All right, thanks. Let me see if I can get the screen shared here. Are you seeing that? I am, yes. Okay. Perfect. Get this started. All right. Okay. So this is going to be a slight shift into some more uh, focused verification work we've done that has its origins in our spring forecasting experiment that Adam just discussed. I want to acknowledge my co authors, in particular, uh, Berkeley Gallo, who actually performed some of the analyses that we'll be looking at. Uh, just a word of caution, I'll be moving through these slides pretty quickly to get through it in the uh, 
time allotment so we can go back for clarifications if needed at the end. So the motivation for this work really does stem from the spring experiment where we look at a variety of, of CAMs and CAM ensembles and we get real-time subjective feedback from the participants. And as more ensembles have come online in recent years, um, one particular theme that we've seen from the feedback is the impressive performance of what we like to call ensembles of opportunity. And by that we mean ensembles like the HREF where we combine um, several independently designed CAMs and process them together kind of opportunistically as an ensemble. So what we've done here in this study is to compare HREF version 2.1, which is the version we currently process at SPC, with uh, two formally designed CAM ensembles that were also evaluated in the experiment. And just to a note that this is all uh, from 2018 uh, basically April through June of 2018, 21 dates during that period, so a couple years old now. Um, but the other two ensembles are going to be the Hurry and then the OU Map Ensemble from 2018. And those two are all part of the clue which Adam talked about. Um, so they share a lot of configuration details and they're differenti differentiated primarily by their strategies for the initial and lateral boundary condition perturbations. Um, you can see from that table in the bottom left, the HREF has a lot of diversity amongst its members in terms of dynamical cores and physics um, and the regional and global models and that they inherit their backgrounds from. So a very different design strategy from the other two ensembles that we'll be looking at. We're going to be looking at two forecast fields, uh, composite reflectivity and updraft helicity. And between the two of them, we should capture kind of the general convective evolution of each of these dates fairly well. This is the kind of thing that we spend most of our time looking at when we're in the experiment. And it's also the main thing that's relevant for SPC operations, which is kind of our ultimate goal in the experiment. So starting out with reflectivity, we're gonna be verifying neighborhood maximum ensemble probabilities, which I'll call MMEPs for short. We're gonna be focusing on the 40 dBZ threshold um, and this is going to be at a neighborhood size of 80 by 80 kilometers. And I want to point out that we do use a percentile based bias correction member by member. So that kind of ensures that we're not unequally weighting members or things like that, particularly with HREF. Um, and also we're verifying hourly snapshots of reflectivity at 13 to 30 hour lead time. So because these are snapshots, you can kind of see how these uh, probabilities are constructed in the figure. Um, there is going to be a penalty for timing errors in this reflectivity verification. All right, so we've computed the Briar skill score here for all the ensemble members of the three ensembles individually, and then also for the ensemble mean forecast at the bottom of each of these panels. On the left panel, it's the CONUS domain, and on the right panel, it's our SFE daily domains where we kind of follow around the, the most pronounced severe weather threat from day to day. And the red extension of those bars on the bottom indicate the score of the ensemble mean forecast for, the, for each ensemble, while the color-coded portion of those bars at the bottom is simply the mean score of the individual member, so kind of the average of the, the same colored bars above on, on that panel. So the red bar can be interpreted here as what we're calling the BSS gained, or the excess skill of the ensemble mean over a typical member of that ensemble. And we're kind of taking that as a measure of how effectively the ensemble is uh, sampling uncertainty within its membership. And what's important here is that the MAP ensemble has the best performing members, um, which you can see with those green bars. But at the same time, the HREF has the best performing ensemble mean forecast. Um, and you can see with the red bars how much larger that red extension is for HREF. So it's really kind of making more out of its membership than the other two ensembles. Now looking at some reliability diagrams for these uh, same forecasts, same two domains on the left and right, we also see HREF producing very reliable uh, probabilistic forecasts for these uh, high reflectivity values within the neighborhood with more of an overconfidence signal from hurry and map. Uh, you kind of see the muted resolution in the middle to high probabilities. So just kind of an under dispersive signal for those two ensembles. And then we did something else that's not so much of a traditional verification technique usually with, with these types of uh, forecasts, but what we did was we computed the correlation coefficient for each possible pair of members within each ensemble. And so these are shown in matrices on that figure at the top. 
And the upshot here is that the href members are least correlated with each other among these ensembles, uh, followed by the hurry. And then the OU map has this members most correlated uh, with one another. So we're kind of getting a picture here of href having the most spread with respect to these convective forecasts among the three that we looked at. There are some interesting details within the, the href matrix as to which members are more and less correlated. But in the interest of time, I'll probably just leave that for any questions people might have at the end. So moving on to surrogate severe, this is essentially applying the same neighborhooding technique that we did for reflectivity to UH. But one big important difference is that we're just taking a 24 hour max UH field each day and then neighborhooding and smoothing that. So this is just you know one field per day. Uh, timing errors are really not going to be penalized for this. And of course, with it being UH, we're focusing on rotating storms, trying to just get uh, severe weather primarily. Um, and because of the lower computational cost of this procedure, which also involves a, a regritting that I won't get into, we're able to actually compute and verify surrogate severe forecasts over a whole range of uh, percentile thresholds and also uh, sigma smoothing values. And so we're going to be looking at the skill over that kind of parameter space here. So on the left here, we have the fraction skill score for the ensemble mean forecast from each of the three ensembles that are labeled on the left of, the, of that figure. Um, and so the maximum FSS attained by each ensemble is denoted by the white dot that has an annotation with the value. And then on the right uh, series of panels, we have the FSS gain. So this is analogous to what we just showed with the BSS gain. But again, we're showing it over this whole parameter space. And um, we see, at least on the left panel with the ensemble mean forecast, the rankings of the, of the best FSS for each ensemble does match what we found for reflectivity with HREF in the lead, uh, followed by OU map, and then HURI. And then interesting, not, interestingly, not only does HREF have uh, the largest FSS gain on the right panels uh, overall, it also achieves its best FSS with a little bit less smoothing than the other two ensembles. You can see that on the left. I've kind of drawn those um, vertical lines to, to indicate which sigma value corresponds to the max score. So given that taking an ensemble mean is sort of a smoothing operation in itself, um, this is maybe again indicating better quality spread in href so that that sort of implicit smoothing in the ensemble dimension is maybe getting you something where you don't have to apply as much smoothing in the spatial dimension. So just to wrap it up with a summary, we found that HREF was best at forecasting convective evolution as an ensemble, followed by OU map and then HURI. And this did match the subjective ratings from participants in the 2018 experiment. The skill differences were most pronounced with less aggressive smoothing, which may not be too surprising. And our analyses indicate that HREF has larger spread that yields uh, better reliability in these forecasts of, of convective storm placement and coverage than the other two ensembles. So kind of the key takeaway here is that HREF's highly diverse membership seems to be sampling model uncertainty fairly effectively. Um, this is something the other two ensembles just aren't able to do um, in this case due to their membership design. And I did want to end with just a couple important caveats. First is that we, we're focused here on the next day problem. So this is like you know 12 to 36 hour lead time, SPC outlook type forecasts. Um, it remains to be seen whether these same uh, findings, how they'll manifest when it comes to something like the worn on forecast problem where you're looking at shorter lead times and smaller scales. And then also just again to emphasize, this is all 2018 data. So a couple years old now, we've just started preliminarily looking at a, a few stats for 2019 data. And there are some indications that between the hurry and the HREF, the gap may have closed a little bit. We may see somewhat improved uh, spread in the hurry in 2019. So that'll definitely be a, a big thing to watch going forward is, is how this difference evolves as the models continue to improve. So that's all I've got. And I'll be happy to take questions if we have time. Great. Thanks, Brett. Appreciate it. That's an interesting talk. Looking forward to seeing the results as we move forward. Um, we have time for one quick question. Jamie, there's nothing on Slack. OK. All right. Well, thank you again, Brett. Appreciate it. We'll move on to our next speaker. 
Um, let's see, we'll pass it over to Israel Yurak, who will be talking about evaluation of time laid CAM ensembles during the 2020 HWT spring forecasting experiment. All right, I just want to verify you can see my screen. Yep, looks great, thanks. All right, yeah, thanks, Jamie. Yeah, so lots of collaborators here, uh, SBC, NSSL, SIMS at OU, and then GSL and uh, the Met Office as well. So Adam already hit a lot of these, so I won't uh, dwell on this. I'm going to focus on the CAM Ensemble evaluation part of the spring forecasting experiment. Um, this is what it typically looks like in the H physical space of the HWT in the springtime. Um, but of course, this is what it looked like this year as we went virtual. Um, but, you know, I think Overall, we were able to do a lot of the things, thanks a lot to the efforts of Brett Roberts, who just spoke on a lot of his web design, web elements, that we were able to take a lot of this virtual. So the CAM Ensemble experiments I'm going to talk about, there was uh, three separate experiments that we did subjective evaluations on, uh, really focused again on time lagging. Um, we we want to consider that as a formal strategy for CAM Ensemble design because of some of the results we've seen in previous years. So as Adam mentioned, we had two different groups, A, B, A group and B group, and we had multiple evaluations. So that's kind of the, the numbering strategy there on the left. Um, so the, the A3 evaluation was looking at two single model ensembles, the HURI and the UM, initialized at zero Z. And then we compared those with the respective time lagged ensembles where we took half of the membership then from the, the previous 18 Z run, just to see how those performed relative to the, the, the zero Z initialized runs. Uh, the B2 evaluation, the second one there, uh, two single model time lagged ensembles, again, the hurry and the UM, looking at the 18 member time lagged ensembles and compare that to a zero Z 18 member multi-model ensemble. Um, and then we also looked at sort of the whole kitchen sink, all 36 members uh, together as a multi-model time lagged ensemble. And then the third experiment I spent a little bit more time on, focus a little bit more on a specific uh, time lagging strategy where we looked at three nine member single model ensembles based at zero Z to look at a, a, a optimal approach. So if you're not familiar with what we do with our subjective evaluations in the HWT spring forecasting experiment, uh, we have sort of these multi-panel plots uh, where we do subjective evaluation of CAM ensemble performance over a regional domain, for example, the one shown there on the right. Um, we do all the participants rate the forecast objectively, one to 10 scoring. Um, uh, focused on what's plotted there is now ensemble max with the neighborhood probabilities and contour. And then we overlay the report, severe weather reports for the previous day. And so obviously you want to see higher probabilities where you have a concentration of severe reports, but, you know, we allow the participants to, you know, subjectively rate how, how they would view that uh, for making severe weather forecasts. Um, as Adam noted, we also compare these experimental ensembles to the HREF, which is the operational baseline um, in the weather service. So for the first experiment, we compared, again, the hurry zero Z ensemble to a, a time lagged hurry ensemble. Same for the UM on the top, there's the zero Z initialized and then the bottom right's the uh, time lag version. And then we had the HRF. We had two versions of HRF. We're moving to version three there in the bottom left. Uh, hopefully later this year that includes the HER V4 and has an FV3 member in it, replacing an NMMB member. So here's the uh, subjective ratings from the participants during the five-week experiment. Um, one thing you can note is that the time-lagged ensembles here um, hurry to its time-lagged in the orange shades. Pretty similar distribution of subjective ratings. Similarly for the, the UM ensemble and its time-lagged uh, counterpart. Um, and I think it's probably safe to say the time lagged ensembles here, the lighter shades, uh, did not necessarily improve the forecast. But at the same time, the forecast looks similar and probably in most cases also didn't degrade the forecast. So it does raise the question, you know, how many members uh, should you initialize at a single time? How much value you're gaining by running additional members? And then, of course, as Adam noted, HREF, uh, as in previous years, subjectively from participants got the highest distribution of ratings for severe weather guidance overall. Uh, the second uh, ensemble experiment, uh, the B2 was pretty similar, um, looking more at the comparison of time lagging to multi-model. So we had the hurry 18 member time lagged ensemble, the UM 18 member time lagged ensemble, and we were comparing each of those to one another as well as to this multi-model ensemble initialized at zero Z. So what's the relative value of multi-model versus time lagging? 
And then in the bottom right, we have kind of the kitchen sink approach, throwing all the hurry and UM members together, multi-model time lag approach, and again, have the HREF as reference. So here's the distribution of subjective ratings from the participants. Um, so you can see the single model, time lagged ensembles, hurry, UM, pretty similar rankings, slight edge to the hurry overall and the, the median and mean ratings, a little bit higher than the UM. Uh, when you do a multi-model approach, combining the hurry and UM at zero Z, you're really not gaining much value. The subjective ratings, again, the distributions overall, pretty similar to the single model time lagged ensembles. And then kind of interestingly and unexpected, at least from my point of view, was I, I assumed if you threw everything kind of together from the hurry and UM, you might get a little bit of an improved uh, improvement in the probabilistic forecast, but that's not actually what we saw uh, this past spring during the, during the experiment. So that was a bit of a surprise. And again, uh, an independent group rating the HREF um, also had it rated the highest of all the CAM ensembles. And then lastly, the B3 experiment, uh, looking at the time lagged experiments initialized from 12Z. So we have here this first one, the hurry, just the, the base hurry. 12Z initialized, initializing off the HERDAS ensemble uh, with stochastic physics, SPP perturbations. Uh, we had a hurry time lag. So we had three of the 12Z members there. We got some diversity by grabbing three members from 6Z and three members initialized from 0Z. And then kind of a special configuration of a, a time lag approach is what we call the her initial wharf time lag. So we have additional diversity using the her and the V4 initial conditions. So we're, we're leveraging the her DAS and initiating uh, the model runs. Uh, we also notice have initial conditions from each run, each member has different hour initial conditions. So we're getting some diversity from uh, different uh, times of init initializing the model. And then we're also having some physics diversity using the Nissle Wharf physics uh, configuration. So five five of the members were basically like the HER V4, and then four of the members were had physics uh, initialized off her, her initial conditions, but using the Nissle Wharf physics configuration in the forecast. Uh, some motivation for the design. Uh, Brett already talked about this, but this is based on some of Brett's work in evaluating uh, some of the individual member of, of Briar skill score, 40 dBZ, so convective forecast. From 2018, we saw the deterministic her had the best forecast, quite a bit better than any of the HREF members or HER-E members. Um, but also interestingly, if you look at the time lag her, a six hour old her actually was was pretty good itself and better than any of the HER-E members. So kind of this idea that, you know, if you produce your best deterministic forecast in a given hour, it's it's better often than more recent perturbed ensemble members. So kind of an interesting thing. And so we wanted to leverage that idea in this uh, her Nissle wharf configuration here on the right. So this was the three panel plot we used, the hurry, the time lag hurry, and then this her Nissle wharf time lag approach. Now this is a pretty uh, typical to what we saw. The probabilities again are the brown contours here where the her initial wharf tended to have somewhat higher uh, probabilities of updraft felicity, which is a proxy we often use to indicate, you know, more potential for severe weather. Um, and in a lot of the subjective comments from participants, um, they also often noted higher POD for identifying where severe weather will occur in this her initial wharf uh, time lagged ensemble. So that was a, a common theme in a lot of the comments. You kind of see that here saying, Eastern Arkansas, where a lot of the reports aren't necessarily within the envelope of higher probabilities, but that's not necessarily the case in the, the one on the right. So here's Just the overall subjective rating distributions. Um, we have the hurry, initialized at 12Z, the time lag hurry, and then the hurry wharf. So you can see pretty similar subjective ratings between the hurry and the time lag hurry, pretty similar to what we saw in some of the other time lagging results. Um, again, so come calling into question, you know, how many members should you really initialize given this strategy at a single time? How much value are you gaining by running more members? And then kind of a, a bit of a surprise. I mean, we had hoped that this design would be an effective time lagging strategy, but these subjective ratings are pretty, pretty robust here, showing uh, a whole point higher in the, the mean and uh, median ratings uh, for this Hernis Wharf configuration. So indicating it's a potentially a useful strategy moving forward for CAM ensemble design.
So uh, to summarize here, um, we evaluated time lagging specifically as a formal strategy for CAM ensemble design during this most recent 2020 spring forecasting experiment. Um, we've seen, as in previous year, the HRF sets a pretty high standard for experimental CAM ensembles, even those that use a multi-model and time-lagged approach. So there's definitely something very specific and special about the way the HRF uh, is designed and, and works together to produce useful probabilistic forecasts. We saw overall that time-lagging did not really improve probabilistic guidance uh, for severe weather forecasts, um, but at the same time, the forecasts were qualitatively similar and didn't really degrade the forecast either. So again, you know, how many members, I think, initialize a single time, that's it's a, a serious question that should be should be asked. So uh, we, we uh, use our resources to our best ability. And then lastly, this approach of using, you know, your best deterministic forecast at every hour, this her nissel wharf time lagging configuration performed pretty well. So using again that time lagging strategy for your best deterministic forecast and, and throwing in some, some physics diversity um, in a single model CAM ensemble may help to improve probabilistic forecasts over other strategies. So thanks for your attention. I'd be glad to answer questions if there's any or time. All right, do we have any quick questions, Jeff, on Slack? Uh, yeah, we're running a little late, but uh, there is a question from Jeff Duda and I see Evan Kalina typing as well. So do we wanna just direct Israel to the, the channel on Slack and move on, or do you think we can entertain one question? Yeah, is that okay with you, Israel? Sure. Okay, okay. great, thank you. Um, all right, so we'll move on to our next speaker then, who is Sean Zhang, talking about the impacts of increased vertical resolution on tropical cyclone track and intensity forecasts using the standalone regional hurricane analysis and forecast system. Okay, can, can you see my screen? We can. All right, okay. So I'm going to shift the gear and talking about the hurricane applications. So the talk, the title of my talk is in Impact of Vertical Resolutions on Tropical Cycle, Tropical Cycle Track and Intensity Forecast Using HALF. So I, first I would like to acknowledge the cost listed here. And so this is the outline of what I'm going to talk about. So first I will give a brief introduction to the two version of HEF, hurricane, hurricane analysis for, and forecast system. So one is 2019 and one is 2018. This, these are the two versions that we used for the studies. And then I'm going to present some verification and the results to answer two questions, one is the impact of model vertical resolution, and, also, and another one is the impact of model vertical resolution distributions on the TC track and intensity forecast within the half framework. Then the summary and the future work. So this is, so basically half is, is FV3 based TC applications. So, this is the one that we used for 2000, 2019 hurricane season. So the configuration basically is we use the horizontal resolution is three kilometers and the timestamp is nine seconds. And the horizontal, the advection scheme we use an hard six, which is less diffusive schemes. And for the physics, we basically we have, we, we introduced some hurricane specific physics packages and the rest of them, I, I'm not going to de describe all of them. And the, the system, we have no data simulation, vortex synchronization and ocean coupling in this, in, the, in this version. And also the, for the initial conditions, we use GFS, NAMS IO, high resolution as in, uh, analysis field and the boundary we use the group two files every three, every three hours. And the the plots at the at the right is the is the domain the, the entire domain. So basically, we want to study the the vertical the, the impact of vertical resolution. So we 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 run two experiments. Basically, the 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 control experiment uses le vertical level sixty four, which is the same as current FV three. GFS 
and then the model top is 0.2 um, 100 pa pascal, and the other one, the experiment, the experiment we, the other experiment we use, we use the 97 vertical resolution, which is very high vertical resolution with model top at two minibar. So that's the difference. One is the vertical difference, vertical level resolution, and the other is the model top. So we run these two configurations for the hurricane during the, the entire cycle of hurricane during. So this is the results. Um, for the top two panels, uh, we compared the high resolution model with the low resolution model. Top two panels is the, the, in the scale space. So whenever you see that the red line is above is the positive values, which means the high resolution improves over the low resolution models. The left, the left panel is the track forecast and the right panel is the intensity forecast. What you can see that after 34, 36 hours, both track and intensity forecast is improved for the, uh, the, the high resolution model improves the track and intensity forecast. And uh, the lower two panel shows you the frequency of, of superior performance, which means it, it compares the average in each, each cycle, at each forecast time, which one is better than the other one. So you can see in most of the case, in most of the model, model lead time, you can see the high resolution model performs better than the lower resolution model. So that's what we, show, we are showing here. And then we compare, this is the whole cycle, whole life cycle of Doreen composite track forecast. And the left side is the lower resolution model and the right side is the high resolution model. And you don't see much difference except the, the circle I show, I'm showing here for the few set, for, for the like several cycles that the lower resolution model has uh, the, the west bias. And, uh, and the high resolution, you can see that, that all the track, trackers are clustered together around the, the, the observation, observe the track. And this is the individual case. What you can see here is the high resolution track forecast. The track forecast is closer to the best track, which is the black line. And this is a high the, the orange is high resolution model and the green line is the low resolution model. And I, I also put some, uh, the GFS VNO model and the official model, HWOLF model as a reference here. So this is, again, this is the, the intensity for, for the same, intensity forecast for the same cycle. You can see the same story, the, the the upper, upper panel shows you the, in, the, the, the wind VMAX 10 meter wind forecast and then the lower panel shows you the sea surface, the central pressure lab verifications. What you can see here is the higher resolution model, although it's not, it improved not, ve not very much, but it's still, it's the, the high resolution model intensity is closer to the observations. But since this is the lower resolution, the, the rest of them except uh, the edge wolf. Yeah, also edge wolf, you, you can see edge wolf also did not very well. It, it's actually, edge wolf has a higher resolution, it's 1.5 resolution model. I mean, half actually did a much good job for this cycle. Two minutes. Okay, so this is uh, another again. It's showing you the showing you the the it the high resolution model improved the the steering flow. Okay, I I I guess after the next experiment I'm with, so we already show you the vertical resolution can perform can improve the model track forecast, but the vertical resolution 
requires more computer resources. So what we're trying to do is trying to adjust the vertical level distributions to see if we can improve using the same vertical level resolution, but different distributions to improve the models. So the list here is the configurations for the 2000 we use this list configurations. So this is, the, so we did three experiments. One is the control run and the, the next is the same resolution, but with different contributions or with different vertical level distributions. What you can see here is below like 400 millibar, the higher, the, this, the, air, the uh, 60 level, 64 levels is almost same, has the same vertical resolution as 90, 91. So this is the two experiments and compare, compare, we are trying to compare with the 61, 64 control resolution. So here, what, what you can see is that the two, two experiments still outperform the track forecast, but the intensity for the forecast is a little behind. So that's the, so we are, what we are trying to, the message here is that we can improve the model forecast even without increase the vertical resolutions. So here the, the, the summary of my summary and the future work is we, we use the two version of halves to do experiment and we present that increased vertical resolution can improve the track, TC track and in track forecast. Then we also demonstrated that by redistribution vertical distributions, we can improve the TC track for, TC forecasts without even increase the computer resolution. So the future work, we are trying to find that we are we will, we will continue to do the experiment to, to find the optimal vertical resolution distributions to have a better forecast performance without even increase, increase the, increasing the computer resources. Uh, I guess that's all I have. Great, thank you. Um, in the interest of time, I apologize. We will have to just direct you to the Slack channel for any questions or comments. There and is one question there for him. OK, great, thanks. And then we'll move into our last speaker right. of the session, um, which will be Andrew Hazelton. And he's going to talk about the HATS Global Nest real-time system and its performance. And I will just mention as he's pulling up his presentation that um, we do go back into the plenary session right after this. It's supposed to start at 3.15. So apologize. We might be a little late getting back to that. But um, and, and I apologize in advance, Andrew. We won't have time for questions after your talk. We'll head straight over back to the plenary. So thank you all, all to our, all of our speakers. Thank you, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can, thank you. Can you see my screen? Yep. Whoops. All right, let me go into full presentation mode. So I'm gonna be talking about um, the Gauss Global Nest real-time system and its performance. Um, I'd like to thank all of our co-authors and collaborators at um, AOML, um, EMC, HGFDL especially. Um, so I have on the bottom a few examples of graphics from both last year's and this year's real-time system for the HAFS Global Nest that I'll be talking about. So HAFS is the Hurricane Analysis and Forecast System. Um, the Global Nest um, takes advantage of the Global Nested two-way feedback capability within FE3. So it's a little bit different than the SAR configuration that um, Zach talked about in the last presentation. Um, last year for the first initial experiment, Global Nest, we used uh, GFS physics, um, but some differences um, of the PBL and surface physics for hurricanes. Um, and uh, we used a six tile layout for FE3. Um, for that, this experiment, we had a layout kind of focused on the Atlantic. Um, so that's the six tile layout here on the top. And then this is just the Atlantic tile. You can see the, the nest we used covered most of the North Atlantic. I'm a little bit smaller than the half star domain, like you see comparing the red and the blue here, but you know, most of the storms were well within both of those. Um, for we did seven day forecasts for these um, at three kilometer horizontal grid spacing. And for last year, um, we used 60, 64 vertical levels. So this is the uh, results from last year. Um, both for, so on the top left, we have the track. Um, the track um, for, we, for both, you know, the, our, the half global nest and also the regional um, uh, half global nest was the best. Um, pretty similar versions, both versions of half. Um, outperformed GFS and HRF and track. Um, for intensity, is a little bit more of a mixed bag. Um, there's kind of an initial uh, low bias here um, that we, because of uh, the broad, um, you know, from initializing off the GFS. Um, but then, you know, it was a little bit better performing at longer lead time. 
One thing we did see was we saw a pretty consistent uh, high bias in R34, so the radius of 34 knot or uh, basically tropical storm force winds that was sort of consistent throughout the season. And so that's something we're exploring and we'll see um, how some of the changes we made for this year impact that. Um, look, finally, I just want to look at the long-term track because we did run these out to day seven, so we can compare a little bit with some of the other global models. Um, and uh, so we compare with the, uh, also the GFS and then the ECMWF and UK Met long range. So after day five, um, half global nest was pretty similar to these, but then a little bit worse kind of at longer lead time, although the sample size gets pretty small there. So just to look at a couple of highlight cases from last year, um, Dorian, which is what Zach showed, um, generally half global nest was correct in showing the, the stall or turn in the Bahamas rather than the track into Florida. We see a couple of examples of that here. Um, you know, so the black is the, is the observed. And and then the uh, the red is our has global nest forecast. Um, so you can see it's pretty consistently right of some of the other operational guidance. Um, you know, turning the storm in the Bahamas rather than and stalling rather than continuing all the way to Florida. And also um, some early forecasts correctly showed that some a small scale core was forming. Um, this is a comparison from the, the 27 August 27th zero z run with uh, radar observations two days later. Um, you can see it that predicted it pretty well, but. Um, if you look at the forecast, it was kind of inconsistent at that time. So you know, Dory was definitely a challenging case, but we were able to get some aspects of it correctly. Um, another kind of important, interesting highlight case from last year was Humberto, because this is a case where it seems like the two-way feedback was important. Um, this is one where, if you look at the tracks on the right, um, if you compare the, the red line and then the light blue line, the red is our half global nest, and then the blue is the star half, you see that the red line, the global nest is closer to reality. Um, now, it showed some of this turn, kind of unrealistic turn back toward the coast, but not nearly as much as in the blue. Um, and then we looked at the, the some of the kind of uh, synoptic fields to see what was causing this perhaps. And it looks like the, uh, so what, what I have shaded here is basically the difference between the forecast um, and the analysis for um, half global nest on the right left, the half star in the middle, and then the operational GFS on the right. And what you see is that, um, you know, they're all, they all had some differences with this ridge up to the north, but that the half global nest with, with the two-way feedback with the nest had the smallest um, kind of bias in the ridge and you know kind of the overall flow along the northern boundary of the nest here. So it seemed like this was a case where the two-way feedback uh, was important and we'll be up to something we want to explore more going forward. One other thing we've been working on at AOML is um, working on uh, physics changes, um, including some modifications to the new EMF PKE scheme based on observations of eddy diffusivity and mixing length, uh, kind of similar to what's been done in H work in the past. Um, one thing to know is that if you look at the blue, the, the default EDMF PKE is better than the default EDMF GFS. So um, we're starting off from a better place anyway, but um, we have some work that we've uh, been um, submitted for publication that shows you know, when you make the modifications to how the, the diffusivity, the mixing length are calculated, um, it leads to kind of convergence of solutions, similar to what we saw uh, with HWORF. And so we're going to be testing that this year. So just to kind of uh, talk about um, applying some of these modifications um, and what we're going to be doing in 2020. Um, so uh, we have, kind of like Zach mentioned in the last presentation, um, it seems like there's some definitely some impact of vertical resolution. So we're showing, we're going to be um, testing a 75 level configuration. Um, if you look at the results um, on the top right here and top middle, uh, there's a um, smaller uh, bias in both intensity and also uh, a better prediction of wind radii um, when we go to the 75 vertical level configuration um, in a uh, fairly limited um, sample set. So we're going to see how that does over the course of the whole season. Um, as a result, because it's more levels, but more computationally expensive, so we're going to be using a slightly smaller nest. Um, and we're also going to be using a, a different global six tile layout so that we can uh, compare with some uh, multiple nest experiments that we hope to run occasionally on Orion. And then um, finally, um, we're going to be saving both. One thing we'll be doing this year is saving both the global and nested data um, to look at, really look at how that two-way feedback is, is impacting the, the flow of both on the globe and the nest and, and what that does um, in preparation for the future um, global nested moving, moving nest system. Um, and if you're interested, I've, I've uploaded my presentation. And if, if you're interested um, to look at the output from this year's real-time experiments, they've been running um, for a few weeks now. Um, and we've been, we're hosting the, the real-time experiments on our for this experiment and others um, at our uh, AOML website here. And so um, we've got a lot, obviously it's an ongoing project and we have ongoing physics development, like I talked about to improve TV structure. And we want to focus on PBL physics. Um, obviously we have limited observations, but leverage what we do have um, and, it, and also things like LES simulations. Um, we're going to explore, like I mentioned, a multiple nesting capability to maybe put one nest on the Atlantic, one on the Pacific. Um, and then uh, we're going to be working on continued development of TC graphical products and for our website. 
Um, and then, you know, I think um, so you might mention this, but um, eventually sometime next year, hopefully start to test the moving nest uh, in that global system. And finally, one big one um, is the incorporation of data assimilation. And we've started working with some of our university collaborators on that. So that's all I have. I don't think we have time for questions, but I'll go check the Slack. So thank you. Great. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I will mention to everybody that they did push the plenary session back to start at 20 after the hour. So we do have three minutes. Um, if we want to ask a quick question here before we head over to the plenary, I'm happy to open it up. Okay, with no questions being asked right now, let's um, thank the speakers. Really appreciate you all um, trying to stay on time. I know that 10 minutes is not very much, so appreciate that. Um, really nice presentations, and please continue the conversation over Slack, and I look forward to um, seeing what comes out of that. So thank you all again, and we'll see you in the plenary session. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Jamie.